Hey everybody, Shane here, Shoebox Legends. Thanks for joining me for what I hope will be a, sort of a thought-provoking episode today. Uh, still gonna show some great cards as we get through the conversation, so worry not, uh, including a couple of really big ones that I've been sitting on uh, for months and months now, kind of waiting for the right opportunity to show them off, and it seems like uh, this would be that time for reasons that we'll get into. Um, but basically, I wanna talk about something that's been on my mind, kind of rattling around in my brain over the past couple of weeks, and that is, the introduction of Negro League statistics into the official MLB record books. Um, this has been big news. I'm sure the majority, if not all of you listening to this video are already aware of it. Um, but after you know many long years uh, of effort and collecting them and verifying them, uh, at long last, Major League Baseball officially adopted the statistics, the known verified statistics from the Negro Leagues. Certainly not a complete record, um, but what they do have and have been able to verify into the major league record books. And what I wanna focus on in today's video is how that has trickled into our hobby, what I've noticed um, in the past couple of weeks since this took place, and some questions that I have about the future of our hobby and whether it will be really significantly impacted by this or not. And uh, so I don't have answers to a lot of these questions, and I'm sure the title of today's video is a little bit clickbaity, it's kind of tongue in cheek, uh, but I am genuinely curious about it as well. Um, so what got me thinking about this is I've heard a lot of collectors over my time in the hobby say things like, you know, I'm only a vintage collector. I don't get into modern um, because I just get confused by all the different cards. Uh, I really only want to collect the players that played a long time ago, and I, I just can't get into modern. And that's fine. I don't judge anybody for their approach uh, to the hobby. I think as long as you're being responsible and having fun, uh, then you're doing it the right way. Uh, but I do think that if you've taken that hardline stance sort of in the past that this um, recent development kind of introduces an, an interesting dilemma for you, um, which is which is what got me thinking about this. So uh, while obviously the inclusion of these stats have impacted tons of players, um, you know, guys who never appeared in the major leagues at all are now part of the record book. Uh, and then guys who maybe transition bridge players uh, who had MLB statistics, those have now been added to or enhanced by this. Um, but it seems like despite everybody that's been impacted, um, you know, as with any typical news story, they want to boil it down and make it easy to digest. And the guy who's gotten the lion's share of the attention from this is this man here who's been waiting patiently in the background, Josh Gibson, uh, you know, agreed that, you know, by most baseball historians to be one of the premier players ever to participate in the game, uh, slugging catcher who was uh, probably the best overall player in the Negro Leagues, certainly on the offensive side of the ball, and uh, never got to play in Major League Baseball. And as a result, uh, and again, this is probably not news to anybody here, as a result of these stats being included, he is now the career slugging percentage leader, taking that over from Babe Ruth, and the career batting average leader, taking that title over from Ty Cobb. So, I mean, think about the names that we're talking about here and, and kind of what that means. Um, and, and so what's happened is um, there's been a huge jump in the popularity of his cards because this guy's all over the news. So, you know, while a lot of baseball fans that have read deep into history uh, or appreciated the game at a very deep level for a long time are obviously already aware of him, I think there's a whole nother class of people who is maybe just casually aware uh, or didn't realize that he was you know, as good as it now appears. Um, and for whatever reason, with this being in the news, he's just getting a lot more attention in the hobby, which I, I think is great. Um, and I think it poses an interesting dilemma to the folks that stick to vintage, because really the way I see it, you have kind of two approaches that you can take now. You know, these Negro League players, Josh Gibson included, they don't really have many, if any, vintage or playing era cards. So now the guy who statistically and acknowledged by Major League Baseball is the quote-unquote best player of this generation, if you stick to vintage cards, you don't have them in your collection. And so there's two ways you could go with this, I guess, if, if that's your approach. You just take a hardline stance that you're vintage only, and you just acknowledge that you're not going to have Josh Gibson in your collection, which is fine. Again, no wrong way to collect. Or um, you adapt, and you start to open your eyes a little bit to... Uh, the possibility of acquiring some modern cards so that you can have this all-time great represented in your baseball card collection. And I think um, the increased attention and the, and the increased prices that I've seen on his cards 
I wonder why that is. Um, is it because of that? Or is it because we have speculators uh, and flippers and, and a new crowd of people uh, who are just looking to capitalize uh, financially on news and, and current events are grabbing up all these cards? Um, is it longtime collectors who have FOMO um, after this announcement that if they don't get some Josh Gibson cards now, they may not be able to uh, as easily or, or as affordably in the future? Some combination of all three of those things. I don't know. Again, I don't have the answers, but it's just gotten me thinking. And uh, just, you know, as an example of kind of what I'm seeing in the hobby since this news broke, my personal favorite Josh Gibson card is this card right here. And it's one that we're going to spend some time uh, talking about in today's video because I've gone a little bit down the rabbit hole acquiring these. So this is from the 2006 Allen and Ginter release. And to me, it's a significant card because it just has the look and feel of a card from the era in which he played. It's on that vintage stock, uh, just has a classic kind of illustrated image there. Um, Allen and Ginter, of course, you know, is a throwback, you know, going back all the way to the 1800s. Um, it just has that old timey feel. And it's one of his first, you know, major product inclusions uh, all the way back in 2006. Obviously he was in one-off sets and highlight sets and things like that, but this is one of his first major mainstream cards. And I just love it for all those reasons. So this is a card that, you know, up until a month ago, you, you could get this for a dollar and you may still be able to find it for that price. This is just a base card from 2006, Allen and Ginter. It's not even a, a high number short print or anything like that. Love that it actually references the Homestead Grays right on the back. Um, this was the beginning of a line of inclusion of uh, maybe, you know, one to two dozen Negro League players uh, in the Allen and Ginter releases over the years, which is uh, something for another day uh, and a separate video. But I've seen this base card in the past few days. In fact, just yesterday, a copy of that sold for between $25 and $30. Uh, or as another example, there's a gold... Gibson card from, I think, the year prior to this um, that is numbered to 500, and I was keeping an eye on this auction. It ended for over $150, um, and that's a card that I have hobby friends who I know acquired, you know, less than a year ago for five bucks. So just a complete explosion uh, in the value of Josh Gibson cards. And, you know, it, he's unique because, as I said, no playing era cards of this guy. So it, it, he's the biggest name now that I can think of in baseball history who lacks a playing era card. You know, if you wanted to collect Jackie Robinson before, you could stick to the 1940s and 50s cards like this one here. And you could say, I'm a vintage collector. I don't get into modern. I don't want to bother with anything like this buyback that you see over here on the left. You don't have that luxury with Josh Gibson. So again, I'm just really curious, you know, is there a chance that Josh Gibson will be responsible for driving more hobby interest towards modern cards. Will he be a gatekeep, you know, a, a gateway drug, I should say, uh, to modern? Because, you know, he may get vintage only collectors looking at modern cards by necessity. And yes, I know there's a 1970s uh, Laughlin cartoon set uh, for the Negro Leagues. I, I get it. Um, but really, he doesn't have any playing era cards. He doesn't have any cards issued while he was living um, at all. And so post playing era is going to be the way to go. And so uh, I don't know. It just it's got me thinking. Um, I thought this was a great opportunity to pull out my Allen and Ginter cards, uh, because as uh, you won't be surprised to hear, um, as I typically do, when I have a card that I like this much and that I feel is this important, I go a little bit deep acquiring uh, different versions. So to go along with that base card, uh, the ones that I care for even more than that are the minis because these are the size of, you know, the traditional tobacco minis like your T206 cards like that. And, and I think that's an even greater look for an Allen and Ginter uh, release. I, I just think these are perfect. Um, this one here is the Allen and Ginter back that has the old planter on it. Um, but I also have the standard back, uh, which is more popular um, out of the two. I, I don't know why that is. Um, given that, you know, parallels are oftentimes more popular with modern cards. Um, I think people like the base because they want to read the write-up, uh, which you don't see on the A and G back. Um, so I have both versions here. Just, again, love this card uh, and went a little bit deep on it because I was buying these, you know, months back. And it, it's just amazing to me um, the shift in attention 
uh, in pricing. I mean, these cards were cheap enough months ago, and I'm not saying this to toot my own horn. It's just something I've observed and I'm curious about. Um, they were cheap enough that months back, I actually picked up both versions, the standard back on the right here and the A and G back on the left, uh, each graded a PSA 10. And if you know me, you know I don't buy PSA 10s. I have very few of them in my collection, but uh, each of these was, I think, around like the $30 price point, which at the time I just thought was like criminal. And it looks like that's maybe coming to pass. But, but you know, I wonder, are these new prices, you know, here to stay? Because there's a genuine interest and appreciation now that wasn't there before for Josh Gibson? Or is this, you know, a pump and dump scenario where we have a lot of flippers uh, hearing the news, going on eBay, scooping up, you know, any Gibson card they can get their hands on and then listing them at obscene prices? Are we going to see a regression in his prices? Uh, I think probably all of that's true to an extent, but again, I would love to hear what your thoughts are. Um, just some other crazy examples. You know, this is the Black Border variant of the Mini, and uh, I saw a PSA graded version of this. I, I, I am not kidding. I, I would really want to fact check this, but you get the point. It went for, I think, close to $1,000, uh, and, and I bought this card for $3.00. Um, like six months ago. And I know it's not PSA graded, but I'm just painting the picture that um, I don't think the spike that has happened here is is the new norm or that this is necessarily going to be sustainable. I think there will be a regression somewhat back towards normal with his card prices. But um, And then I have two more and then a couple more questions to close out the episode. Two more Gibsons that I wanted to show off. And these are the two big ones um, that I've really, really been uh, kind of waiting on um, this last mini here, I am, uh, so grateful. I'm patting myself on the back, my past self for buying this. Uh, this is one of the toughest versions to get of this card. It's the bazooka back, which is numbered to just 25 copies. And, uh, I love that they add, you know, the old planter here blowing a bubble on the bazooka back. I think that's so uh, appropriate. Um, this is my overall best Josh Gibson card. Uh, I'll never get rid of it, and I probably should grade it um, at some point. Uh, a monster, I, I believe. I'd have to look back, but I think I got this um, at a price point where it didn't even require eBay authentication. That would definitely not be the case any longer based on uh, what I'm seeing. Again, I don't care because I didn't buy this card to flip it or sell it. I hope to have that card in my collection uh, for as long as I'm collecting, but I do care uh, in the sense that I, I would like to add some more Josh Gibson cards, and um, so it's interesting to me um, to kind of try to predict whether these prices are the new norm or whether I'm better off, you know, waiting it out a little while before uh, expanding my collection of the man. And then, of course, if you know me and you've been by this channel with any frequency, you know my, one of my little kind of niches in the hobby is buybacks, and I have this Jackie Robinson framed buyback, um, so you can tell where this is going. Actually, uh, this may be even rarer than the Bazooka, for all I know. It probably is, um, but they're not numbered. Got the 10th anniversary buyback that was issued in 2015 Allen Ginter. So this card was pack issued for a second time uh, as a buyback. This is definitely uh, one of the crown jewels of my buyback collection. Uh, I guess even more so now, although um, I appreciated it so much to begin with, but kind of an extra level of significance. Um, after the statistical change and, and the recent news, um, just just crazy stuff. And uh, so I guess my you know my questions are: Is this here to stay? Are these prices here to stay? And uh, you know, is this going to get more collectors who were not interested in modern previously interested in modern now? Uh, are people going to adapt or maybe loosen their strict guidelines? And and is it going to have a trickle effect? into other Negro League players who now have their statistics entered and are maybe being talked about a little bit more like Buck Leonard. There's a great Buck Leonard from last year's Prism set. Um, not somebody that you've traditionally heard much about in our hobby, but an incredibly interesting player. I don't know. Um, there's not a ton of this stuff out there. I, I think for a lot of these people, I, I haven't necessarily seen a trickle effect yet, um, but I'm curious if we will. And for that matter, is there going to be a trickle effect into just more modern cards in general. You know, I have quite a few friends um, in the hobby who I've seen just in the past two or three years transition from vintage only collectors to vintage and modern and, and to kind of gain a new appreciation for modern cards. 
Uh, I think many or most, if not all of you know a few collectors that way, maybe even some of the same ones I'm thinking of, but um, is this change and is Josh Gibson's rise in popularity going to provide a bump in interest for modern cards? Um, again, would love to hear your thoughts below. Um, don't have any answers myself, but I just find it intriguing and uh, certainly something that I'll be watching closely uh, as we move forward here as far as uh, you know how our hobby uh, how our hobby world turns, I guess. Um, so with that, we're going to wrap this up. I can't believe I went on for over 15 minutes. Um, but just, again, something that's really been on my mind and would love to hear from any of you, uh, whether it's a comment, uh, reach out any way you can. But um, yeah, just curious what your thoughts are and uh, hope you enjoyed the episode, some of these cool Negro League cards and otherwise. And, uh, you know, I'll be back soon with some more content. Till then, enjoy the hobby, everybody. See ya.